Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, today is Tuesday, June 21st, 2022, and I'll call this meeting of the Chanhassen Planning Commission to order. Uh, before we begin, just a few reminders. Uh, the Planning Commission is a recommending body to the City Council. Uh, to follow an item all the way through, you'll want to follow that with City Council for final action. On tonight's agenda, there are three public hearings. Uh, in the case of a variance, any person aggrieved of the decision on a variance made by the Planning Commission may appeal the decision. Appeals must be filed within four days of tonight's decisions. Uh, public input will be accepted when the Planning Commission opens the public hearing portion of an item. Any persons wishing to speak must come up to the podium. Uh, state their name and address for the record, please, before they begin. Uh, items before the Planning Commission will be reviewed using the following format. First, we will introduce the item. Uh, staff will then make a presentation of the report. Uh, either the applicant or developer will be asked to make a presentation. Uh, I'll then open the public hearing for public input. I'll then close the public hearing. Commission members may make comments, ask questions uh, or motions, uh, and then we will have a vote. So with that, I'll call the first item, uh, B1 Hackamore Brewing Code Amendment Request, and turn it over to... Mackenzie. Mackenzie. Excuse me, uh, Mr. Oh. Chairman. Yes. Commissioners, I was supposed to remind you that when you're speaking, if you could please turn your microphones on. So noted. <laughs> so this is a code amendment. Um, just there are two ways that code amendments can come about. Um, the first and most common way is either the city council or staff observes something in the code we would like to change, and then staff initiates the code amendment process and brings it before you. The second, um, less common way is when either a resident or a business requests that the city changes the code. An example of this would be when Mr. Degler requested that the city create an interim use permit for agro-tourism, uh, if you remember that. This falls into the latter category. We've uh, had the Hackamore Brewing Company request that we amend our industrial office park district. So, uh, Bob, I believe I may need you to do aero duty. <laughs> Sorry about that. So the applicant is proposing to put a brewery and tap room here. Uh, this is at Lake Drive East and Dell Road in the Dell 5 development, which is zoned industrial office park. Uh, currently, our city code allows breweries and tap rooms in this area, but restaurants are not permitted, which would prevent him from having a commercial kitchen. So he is requesting that we amend the code to allow a commercial kitchen accessory to a tap room. So staff looked it over, and we went through these more in the report, and I'll drill down as much as you'd like during questions, but you know, one of the reasons why we don't allow restaurants in the industrial office park district is because we don't want commercial uses in our industrial districts. Um, however, we do recognize that older industrial buildings are not always as desirable for modern industrial uses, and we've become a, more flexible with what we allow in these districts. Accessory commercial like tap rooms and cocktail rooms are already permitted in the industrial office park district. Uh, when staff looked into it, we don't believe there's a significant difference in the impact that allowing an accessory kitchen versus what's currently permitted would be on the site. You're not going to generate more traffic for a tap room with a small kitchen than you would just with the tap room or with a tap room that served, you know, frozen pizzas heated up on the counter. Uh, because of this, we don't believe this would negatively impact the district. Uh, especially if conditions are put in place to ensure that this remains a brewery and tap room and that it does not you know, ever morph into a restaurant. Uh, for that reason, staff is proposing in response to this request to allow commercial kitchens in conjunction with tap rooms and cocktail rooms as accessory uses in the industrial office park district. Our proposed conditions with this would be that these businesses would not be eligible for on-sale intoxicating liquor licenses. So they wouldn't be allowed to have hard liquor or beer not brewed on site. Um, it has to be accessory to a tap room or a cocktail room, and the brewery must be licensed as a brew pub. Um, brew pubs and breweries, the main difference under Minnesota's licensure is breweries can have a distribution component, so a brewery can sell alcohol to liquor stores and tends to be more production-focused. Brew pubs are not granted that and are limited entirely to on-site. Um, Typically, they tend to be 
more restaurant and feel, although that's not necessarily mandated under state definitions. Uh, with that being said, I know I went through it fast, but I'd be happy to go into any level of detail you'd like. Mm -hmm. Have you received any feedback from the neighboring offices in this industrial park regarding this request? We have not received any public comment on this request. Okay. Thank you. I know one of the um, <clears throat> standards is must be accessory to tap room, cocktail room. How do you decide? How do you, is it subjective? If I just say that I have a brewery first and a restaurant second, am I in good yep. standing? Yeah, so you're right. This is a fuzzier one. What we would do is we would look at the floor plan that they're submitting. So if we saw, for instance, that, oh, wow, in your, say, 10,000 square feet, you have 500 square feet dedicated to production, 2,000 square feet dedicated to your commercial kitchen, and I'll say, you know, we're going to have a conversation and we're going to say, no, this is not accessory. It's very clearly this is a restaurant that has just enough brewing to qualify as a brew pub. Um, when we looked at the floor plans, you know, that were submitted, we're looking at about a eight, 900 square foot kitchen. Um, I can't remember. I'm the owner can speak to the production size, but it, you know, it was clearly a brewery first with a food component second. Perfect. Thank you. What is the city's reasoning behind wanting to keep commercial and industrial separate? Yep. Um, a lot of it is when we look at how our city's land use is guided, we've made very deliberate choices to concentrate the commercial in the city's downtown and then in a couple secondary commercial corridors for neighborhood support retail. Uh, the one deviation from that would be Avienda, where the city did a large study and found that, yes, we could support you know a secondary commercial hub there. The goal is to have a vibrant downtown, um, keep those businesses healthy. One of the issues too is you have differing rents and parking standards in these, sorry, parking standards would be the main issue in these districts where their parking is designed for industrial users. Commercial uses tend to have higher turnover, higher traffic volumes. The streets in these areas are just quite frankly not designed for it. So if these businesses flip, have, these areas flip heavily commercial, we run into a lot of parking issues, um, as well as tax-based diversification. It's good to have industrial properties, but because they tend to have lower price per square footage than commercial properties, it's also good to restrict uses so that competition doesn't push out our industrial users and businesses, which also tend to have more jobs, higher paying jobs, and retail. So a lot of factors go into why you try to keep those districts separate and protect your industrial. That makes sense, thank you. So a question about parking. So mm -hmm. I've been to other um, establishments that use industrial spaces, and the parking becomes an issue. They fill up all the spots, and there is a lot of traffic. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, you don't want two or three of these next to each other. It's a mess. How do, you, how do we prevent that in the future? Is there any... Yep. So uh, one of the first things we did when we were approached uh, by this brewery and they said, you know, we're interested in going in this building, we told them they would need to demonstrate they could meet parking. Um, so they went through and gave us a list of all the current users and showed that based on our parking standards and then the owner of the building being willing to enter into a cross-access agreement with a neighboring building that they could meet the city's parking standards. We... If another brewery, say, went into that next building, they wouldn't be able to do that because we'd say, okay, prove you meet the parking standards, and they'd come across all the parking that has been taken up by this business, and they would not be able to make it. So that's the protection. The owner of the building who has leased this property to the tenant understands that. You know, They're using their parking budget to get this business. Um, in terms of this site, we, we were concerned about parking, I did two different drive-bys at different times of the day when the other businesses were present, and I counted 20-some cars in the lot one time for 180-some spaces and 35 another time. There, these, this area is not heavily parked. The businesses are very low traffic generating that are currently present. And so we looked at all of that and decided, in this case, we're comfortable with this business going in. 
I, I don't think there are that many industrial properties that would be able to make the parking requirements. Uh, did that answer the question? Yeah, so that will be on a street Every business coming into any site in the city has to show us they meet parking. Okay. So, yep. Thank you. Just to, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, we're only really talking about kitchen or no kitchen today, though, right? Even if we deny or vote against this, brewery still can go in, right? If he believes that uh, the numbers still work and his business plan is, you know, still viable with that oh, with that element of his business, yep, breweries and tap rooms are a permitted use in this district. Um, he's demonstrated he meets the parking standards, so he can go in as a brewery tap room, no problem. And, and I'm sorry if I missed that makes sense. Thank you. Sorry if I missed this, but if we say yes and approve, is it just for this specific? location this specific uh, IOP district or would it become permissible for every thing zoned IOP district in the city yep so we are amending the base industrial office park district so it would change it for every industrial office park zone property in the city um, again there aren't a lot of them that are going to have the parking to support a brewery but you know in theory we felt looking at it you know, you try not to do spot zoning. You try not to change your zoning for one subtenant or one sub area unless it's a planned unit development which has unique zoning standards. So we looked at it as if this proposed use is acceptable here, then it should be acceptable in all industrial office parks in the city, or we probably shouldn't be going forward with the amendment. And again, we felt comfortable with it. I'm sorry, one more question. Mm -hmm. so, to, can you bring us? Just up to speed on the recent changes to the to the food truck uh, permissibility in these areas. So, if, for example, they were not permitted to have a commercial kitchen. Are food trucks permitted in the IOS, IOP district? Yep. So that was a change that was made, I believe, just about a year and a half ago or so, um, in response to the city's other brewery saying that you know our our previous policy had been you could have a food truck through a temporary event permit. You were limited to 15 calendar days a year. Um, they felt that was limiting their operations and that a lot of businesses would benefit from being able to have food trucks you know, whenever it was convenient for them and their customers. And so the city council changed that ordinance and said you know, mobile food vendors are allowed basically as frequently as they want to be there. Um, that's another thing that did factor into us making this change. If we're already allowing food to be present, you know, every operating day in the city, does it matter from the city's perspective whether it's made on site or in a truck that's now taking up three parking spaces? Thank you. You guys have me gun shy. Any other questions for staff? All right. Uh, then I will invite the applicant or owner to please come up and hi, Hello. welcome. My name is Zach Gleason. I'm the founder of Hackamore Brewing Company. Um, do I have to get my address? Is that what you said? We got you. Right? Gotcha. Sounds good. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, uh, kind of high level overview of Hackmore Brewing. We are looking to be um, a little bit different than your everyday brewery. We are looking to be a little bit more upscale and elevated. I'm partnering with um, an award-winning builder, John Kramer and Sons, and he's gonna be doing the build out. And we're gonna focus on having um, a little bit more upscale amenities within the brewery. Um, it's going to be uh, a place to go and have a lot of fun while you have craft beer. So we're gonna have Golf simulators. We're gonna have uh, a stage so that we can have some live music in there, and I'm gonna have um, a presentation of a, a, a pro shop with apparel to really kind of give a, an elevated uh, vibe to our brewery. Um, I want to have food because it's gonna keep people in their seats longer, and I want to have people come in there to be able to watch a football game and you know, not have to leave, uh, you know, going to breweries myself when you're hungry, if they don't have food, you go somewhere else. So I want to find a solution to uh, keeping them there. And food trucks, while they're fantastic, I will say I'm very, very versed in them. They are, there's a food truck shortage, I would call it, in a sense. 
Um, I know a lot of brewery owners, food trucks will say they're coming on Saturday and then they'll back out on you on Friday because they found a better place to go. And now you have no food and it leaves you high and dry. This is my answer to not having to call out food trucks. And I really do want to have just a, a small focused menu. Um, for example, the menu's not fully built out yet, but something like a burger, chicken wings, french fries, and that's about it, you know. Um, it's, when you were speaking, Mackenzie, to the square footage, the, um, the kitchen is actually about five to 600 square feet, so it's kind of like a, a ghost kitchen size, you could say, um, while the, the brewery area, the actual brew house, is gonna be about 4,000 square feet of the 10,000 square feet. The rest is gonna be tap or um, the, the tap room. So uh, it really is gonna be first and foremost a brewery. Don't have any interest in wanting to sell other alcohol or wine or anything like that. We wanna sell our beer. So that is a quick overview of the brewery. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Gleason. Yeah. Any questions for Mr. Gleason? Thank you. All right, thank you. All right. Uh, so with that, I will open the public hearing of this item and invite anyone in our audience to come speak about beer or chicken wings. <laughs> Seeing none, I will close the public portion uh, and open it to my fellow commission members for comments, questions, or motions. I'm personally always in support of providing food where you're providing alcohol. I think it's a safety thing for the community as well. Anybody else? I can propose a motion. Perfect. The Planning Commission recommends that the City Council adopt the attached ordinance amending Chapter 20 of the City Code concerning permitted accessory uses in the Industrial Office Park District. We have a valid motion. Do we have a second? I'll second. We have a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes seven to zero. Mr. Gleason, good luck. I like everything on your proposed menu so far. <laughs> so. Uh, no, you are free to go. Your item will go before City Council and final approval. Uh, moving on to planning case 2022-08, the Goodman Homestead. And I'll turn it over to Mr. Generous. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Commissioners, uh, planning case 2022-08, Goodman Homestead, is a replat of a property on Pleasant View Road. Uh, John Goodman is the applicant. While it's... Consider the subdivision, there's no additional lots being created. There's one lot being created out of a lot and an out lot. Uh, 915 Pleasant View Road, the property is owned single family residential district. It permits a single family home on it. It consists of lot one, block one, Edwards Vogel edition, and out lot A, a Vinewood edition. Um, like I said, he's just trying to combine the two. He wants to get a building permit over the, a, a portion of outlot A, and to do that, we need to replat the property. It's a single family home on the property. It's accessed via a private driveway. Uh, historically, outlot A was for access to the old farmstead that was to the south of this house. So. Uh, it's served by... Um, uh, city sewer and water services and again it's a lot in a platted out lot he's creating one large larger lot out of the two parcels and uh, there's an existing drainage and utility easement on the east side of existing lot one as a condition of approval and with the final plat he will be vacating that easement and dedicating a new easement on the new eastern property line uh, staff is recommending approval of the replat for Goodman Homestead subject to the, I think there's three conditions in the report, and adoption of the findings and fact and recommendation. With that, I'd happy, be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, sir. Any questions? 
Well, I should note that there are no public comments on this project, except for people wanting to buy a lot if they were creating it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Bob, that was my question, which is the property is next to this lot, but it's also next to a couple other lots, and they had no comment on? No comment. Especially since they heard that there was no additional development proposed, and no new home sites were included as part of the subdivision. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions for staff? Seeing none, uh, I would invite the applicant to join us. Yes, good evening. My name is John Goodman, and my wife, Cheryl, and I own the property at 915 Pleasant View. Um, everything that we're doing is already inside of our fence, and we're just trying to combine these because we wanted to build a small garden shed, and you can't put anything on the outlot, so we would have had to put it 22 feet inside our property and take down a large oak and a large maple. So with Bob's help, and we thank you for that, we're just trying to combine our existing properties into one so that we can proceed with the shed. We appreciate your consideration and recommendation. Perfect. Any questions? Fantastic. Thank, Thank you, you sir. Uh, with that, I'll open the public hearing portion and invite those who want to talk about sheds or outlots to join us. Seeing none, close the public portion and comments from commissioners. I will say I drive past this property every single day and would have no idea this was not this man's property so I say save the trees yeah yes I think it makes perfect sense um, I'll put forth a motion uh, the Janice and Planning Commission recommends approval of the replot of the Goodman house homestead subject to the conditions of approval and the adopting and the adopts the findings of fact and recommendation we have a valid motion do we have a second, I'll second. thank you sir all those in favor uh, aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes seven to zero. Thank you, sir. <laughs> you can still catch him. He's accepting offers. All right. Uh, moving on to our third public hearing, uh, B3 Santa Vera Residential Development Concept PUD Amendment. And I will turn it over once again to Mr. Jenner. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Commissioners, uh, planning case 2022-09, Hanson Homes. It's a 2022 development project. Uh, they currently have property that zone planned unit development. It permits an additional 30-unit apartment building. The concept plan review allows them to come in and sort of put a different proposals online without doing all the expensive engineering work and finding out that that's not going to go forward. It allows them to shake out the project and see what's acceptable to the city and the community before they put all the time and effort into coming up with an actual development plan. What staff's review is to provide them with an outline of the issues that they would need to address if they were to move forward within the development project and also to get uh, comments from the neighborhood. So, uh, The location is 615 Santa Vera Drive. The property is zoned Plans Unit Development Residential. It would permit an additional 30 apartment units on the property. Uh, uh, the comprehensive plan guides the property for high residential high density uses, which permits density of eight to 16 units per acre. To the south of it is all uh, public, semi-public land. It's the school property and the parkland out there. And then to the north, east, and uh, west are uh, residential low density properties. Uh, residential high density permits density ranges of 8 to 16 units per acre. Uh, typically, it's apartment developments or condominiums. However, you can also do that through other housing types, such as uh, village or cottage homes, which are the small lot residential uh, townhouses, or, you know, again, apartments or condominiums. So. The existing site has an 18-unit, two-story apartment building and access via driveways off of 
uh, Santa Vera, and off of Laredo. So it's served by public sewer and water. Uh, the concept plan they propose is uh, 30 to 35 additional apartment units in a separate building, five single-family homes, detached housing, six townhomes, and an additional eight units added on another level to the existing apartment buildings. Um, the concept would is a sort of Euclidean. It, it, it has all these uses on their one property, but it... They're showing the uh, detached housing on the south side, uh, the townhouses in the middle, and then the apartments to the uh, west and north. And I'll turn it over to Eric to discuss. It. All right, thanks, Bob. Mr. Chair, Commissioners, um, I'll briefly go over the existing drainage, some of the stormwater management, um, extraordinary concerns, and then some of the access management stuff. Um, Here's kind of an image of the topography of the site to give everyone an idea of the existing drainage patterns that um, exist on the site. Currently, it, um, drainage is routed from west to east. Um, in the stormwater design, that has to be maintained. Proposed design shall maintain existing drainage patterns. Um, currently, there are no existing stormwater infrastructures or BMPs on the site. Um, when the site was developed in the 70s, um, there weren't robust regulations or requirements for stormwater treatment, so there is none currently on the site. Um, also to note, um, these purple highlighted areas here indicate where uh, there's documentation of um, small wetlands. I think they're managed three, so they're of lower quality, but there are some wetlands on the site where uh, there was a delineation performed in 2017, which would have to be uh, redone when the applicant comes in with construction plans. Um, as they do expire within five years. So um, it is just noted that, as typical with any development, they'd have to meet all the requirements from WACA and our um, wetland alteration permit through the city. Yeah, do you want to? Thanks. Regarding stormwater management, as I kind of indicated earlier, there is uh, currently no stormwater management as it wasn't required at the time. Based on the concept plans, they're not full construction plans, again, really high level plans, but it would appear that they would meet the requirements for. Um, enacting the rules and regulations of the city and the watershed so they would have to account for all the, the typical requirements, water quality, abstraction, um, or volume control, and rate control. Um, the site is located in an older part of town, which does have you know minimal uh, stormwater treatment, which kind of ties into one of the recommendations from uh, the city or staff uh, regarding stormwater treatment, which would be going above and beyond the requirements of what would be typically required um, through the PUD process, you know, they're, they're looking for some relief when it comes to some ordinances. So through ordinance, PUDs do allow that the city receive some benefit, and we feel that um, based on the intensification of the site, a 50% increase in the size of the stormwater BMP would, be, um, would align with the intensification of the site. So it would uh, supply um, much needed water quality for the, the area, the development, and the surrounding neighborhood. <coughs> Do you want to hit the X? Thanks. Um, I'm useful. <laughs> more, more pictures here, less words. So um, this is to kind of go through and describe some of the street access and pedestrian routes that were pr proposed through the conceptual plan. Um, again, we didn't have construction plans, but um, looking at the site layout and the surrounding street network, staff would uh, support and recommend the approval of a private street. It would need to align with the intersection of Laredo Drive and Del Rio uh, and extend into the site. Um, one of the things that's apparent with the increase in density for this site is that it would um, require the need for a traffic impact study. Um, with the increased density, we're going to see some trip generations that would need to be evaluated when it comes to the, the surrounding street network. Uh, traffic impact studies look at kind of existing conditions and full build out. They do an analysis of any kind of critical or uh, safety issues that might occur from an increase in um, traffic and the street capacity. They also look at intersection um, level of services and things like that. So um, based, again, on, on having a more intense use in the area, we would require uh, upon submittal of the construction or preliminary construction plans a traffic impact study to assess that. Also, the, the, the study would need to look at um, internal site circulation as we would recommend the, uh, a private street. Um, it has to meet ordinances and as such they can't connect uh, 
a through street, essentially, a private street connecting to to public streets, so um, turnarounds, things like that, um, would need to be evaluated for on-site, which, again, is pretty standard for any site improvement. Um, the applicant has proposed um, some pedestrian routing, um, which staff does generally agree with. There is a lack of sidewalk connecting Laredo Drive to an existing trail system to City Park, so they are proposing to evaluate looking into sidewalk along Saratoga and Santa Vera, which um, you know staff agrees with. Um, be it that the recommendation would be for a private street internally, um, staff um, does not recommend having any type of pedestrian or public pedestrian access that would go through private property. It's atypical, it can cause confusion, and um, it's not something the city would recommend. Um, of note as well, I think the conceptual plan did propose a removal of some public uh, trails, um, which has been reviewed by staff and, and parks at this point time it wouldn't be recommended to remove that that uh, pedestrian access way um, based on that that review okay. and I'll take over um, there were some miscellaneous items regarding uh, the building permit requirements if they were to redevelop the site specifically addressing the existing building uh, should they add a third story to it, they would have to bring the entire building up to compliance with current building and fire code requirements. Uh, primarily, it's the, uh, the sprinkler system requirement, but they'd also have to comply with uh, our, any other building code requirements in the house. And since this is an older apartment building, there may be some upgrades that are needed, HVAC or whatever. Uh, that would be determined as part of the building permit review for that. Additionally, they would have to bring it into compliance with the zoning requirements for parking standards uh, for uh, apartment residential developments, and so they'd have to have at least one enclosed uh, parking stall per unit and then the additional parking stalls per unit plus visitor parking requirements. So that would be something that they would need to evaluate as part of any future development. Uh, again, this gives them up front that these are issues that they're going to have to address if they're going to go further along in this process and they can evaluate whether it makes sense to continue with that item or to do something else. Uh, I did receive an email and I distributed it to you regarding from uh, Amy Anderson, and her concerns were with safety regulated uh, regarding the traffic and the pedestrian circulation on the site. Also, the size and scope of the development. Uh, she wasn't sure that this all this development would be fit on the site. Uh, specifically, she was concerned with two apartment buildings and the townhouse units and single families. She just didn't th think that worked. And then the hardcover uh, implications for the site. Even using impervious surface, uh, impervious pavers, there's a system involved and it only it can handle so much. And so that was her concern. I did receive a call this morning from a gentleman who was concerned. He was just opposed to the project in its entirety, he says no more high density. He's against the high density, and he was against the um, tree removal that would be required based on the, new, the redevelopment of the site. I also received correspondence from a, wo a woman who was a, uh, concerned about the project specifically for traffic safety and uh, pedestrian safety concerns because uh, the traffic from the school and the uh, city's uh, uh, ball fields uh, constrict ability to circulate through the site. And again, that's what we didn't have those comments in place, but it was one of our concerns, and the requirement for the traffic impact study would uh, help us to review that. Uh, her other concern was with tree removal. And so. That's it. Let's see. And she was again opposed to the high density. She thought it was too many units. So, with that, staff is recommending that we receive uh, discussion from the, the public to see about that and see whether or not this mix of uses seems appropriate for the site, and then to forward that with the direction in the staff report for what the next step phasing would be. 
Uh, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, sir. Questions for staff? Uh, Bob, does the city require the developers to include any green building components in new construction? The, there's no specific requirements. We can encourage that. But it hasn't been a policy decision from city council. Okay, thank you. Bob, I have a question for you related to the, uh, I think it's five single-family homes. Um, they have detached garages. And it, to me, based on looking at this, the reason why they're detached is because the lots are extremely narrow. And this is the way that you kind of shoehorn a, a single-family house into the spot. Um, is, there, is there a standard related to this? I mean, I, I can't remember the last time I saw, you know, in a suburb like Chanhassen where a new house was built with a detached garage. That doesn't seem um, very standard. Um, so I'd like your opinion on that. Uh, it's not a standard. Our ordinance requires a minimum two-car garage for every dwelling unit, detached dwelling unit. We don't specify attached, detached. Uh, again, our concern, given our environment, that a detached garage may not be the best option, but, you know, it's really up to the developer to determine what their final design is. Uh, as part of our discussion, we can uh, recommend that maybe looking at the cottage or village style home, smaller lots, small detached units, almost like detached townhouses, but individual units. And um, Walnut Grove is an example of that, or North Bay would show you how that type of uh, unit could be built. But again, we'll leave it up to direction from Planning Commission and City Council and the developer's evaluation of the project. Our only recommendation and concern is that they need to excuse me, be within the 8 to 16 units per acre for the development to be consistent with the comprehensive plan. So, okay. Thank you. Uh, does staff have any share the concerns that some of the residents made in their emails and phone calls to you regarding the density of the site compared to the surrounding single-family home uh, in the neighborhood as well as the school and city park and ballparks? Well, that's the consistency with the comp plan is one of the issues. As proposed, this would be at 18.25 units per acre, Complement said maximum density of 16 units per acre, so something has to give there to make that consistency. Uh, we looked at the, we evaluated, you know, traffic is a concern that we had also, and so we wanted to, that to be studied. Uh, tree removal, we're aware that that, that happens. Uh, the hardcover is, our stormwater is concerned about that, and they want to make sure that they adequately address it. Again, they pointed out that this is an older neighborhood, and so they don't have the stormwater best management practices in place that we have in new development, and we would require and encourage the developer to oversize their system to accommodate some of that. Any other questions for staff? I guess... Can we just really clarify the procedural part of what we're talking about today? This is, so a yes today and a yes from the city council on this would mean that we're moving forward with the concept, but then there's still a lot of studies, a lot of requirements, a lot of et cetera. Could you just ex expand a little bit more on the procedurals so we kind of all understand what moving this specific step forward would mean for the project and for the neighborhood? Uh, concept approval doesn't grant any standing, but it does provide direction. So this group could come uh, recommend and council could say uh, no additional apartments in the existing building. That wouldn't be something that's acceptable or that uh, we want to see a public street within the project rather than a private street. 
and then it would be up to the developer to determine whether or not he wanted to continue through with the process. And the next phase would be a preliminary plat review and uh, potentially a site plan review. And at that stage is when they would gain the, stat or the standing for the development, but they'd also have to address all those issues that we pointed out as part of the concept. I think it's fair to say this is the testing the waters step. Mm -hmm. Bob, in, in your experience, could I ask you to opine on why a developer would propose, even at this concept stage, a development that is in excess of the density requirements in the city? Why, why would they do that? To see if it's acceptable. But if it, <laughs> if it, isn't, on, if it isn't on the face of it, why take everybody's time and make the effort and spend the money to do it. Well, the good news is we have an opportunity to ask the developer that in just a moment. Questions for staff? All right. Well, with that, I will turn it over to said developer if he or she is here with us. Thanks for taking time to meet with us today. Uh, my name is Charlie Hansen. This is my dad, Gary Hansen. Gary Hansen. Um, my grandpa over here is Doug Hansen. So um, before we get kind of lost a little bit in the details of this, I know this is a lot kind of going on. Um, just wanted to say that um, I live in this neighborhood as well, and I understand a lot of people have concerns about it, and we're here to kind of listen and take time, and, and we get that this is a big deal. So. Um, as well as, um, I own a small business here as well, so I'm invested in Chanhassen, as well as my dad. And um, I'm also the president of the farmer's market here in Chanhassen, which the city gave up this last year. So um, this is my city, that's what we want to say, and uh, we're here to make the most of it and, and listen to all you have to say, so I appreciate all of you being here. Um, to also give a little to context with my grandpa who is here today, um, he bought this kind of land around this area, area from Farmer Kerber back in 1963. So he's been around for a while and a lot of these homes, maybe some of you are living in today, are one of the 200 plus houses that he lived, um, that he built back in 1963. So just that, just wanted to give a little context to that and just say that we're, we're here to listen and understand. So. Um, yeah, so just to kind of look now a little bit more into the future here. Um, we wanted to do, you know, currently it's, um, it's zoned for an additional apartment building and there was a previous plans put in place to essentially do apartment building but then pave a lot of this and add garages which immediately, um, you know, cut down a lot of these trees as well as just didn't make it blend with the neighborhood. So what we want to do is add a mixed development where, um, again, this is a concept plan, we're trying to figure out all the details with it, but we want to, it's, essentially from Laredo, have this blend a little bit with more with the neighborhood. And no, we are not cutting down the trees. I know that's something that I, you know, next door on Facebook, I was trying my very best to get people on track about is, you know, those trees are, as much as they're cottonwoods and you're driving down the street and there's, you know, stuff going, it's like, looks like it's snow in the middle of, you know, June. Um, they are tree cover and um, I think that's important, especially for the school. Um, as well as um, just for the surrounding area. So part of the reasons for those um, detached garages, we were able to kind of um, say there's this massive tree there. We're able to move that garage maybe a little bit here and there to save as much tree cover where, you know, doing a larger unit um, doesn't really allow us that flexibility. Um, so yeah, so we're just, that's kind of our, you know, our heart with this project. Um, and yeah, we're happy to take any questions from anybody. And, uh, yeah, I think, uh, and Bob, you'll have to chime in, but um, um, I do believe we, so history-wise, uh, my dad tried to do this in 78, 2004, 2014, here's, here's uh, now the 22. Uh, prior to that, the PUD limited it only to like 24 units that we could put on here. Now all of a sudden this year, uh, we presented it and uh, it sounds like the Met Council is actually wanting more density here in Chanhassen. And that, um, you know, that's why we're thinking, well, what's maximum? It's not like we're going to 
shoehorn this stuff in. But, and it is a concept, and we're willing to, you know, we'd like to do something. It's a very, I think it's kind of an eyesore for the community. What's this lot here doing? It's just gravel, and it's not finished, and, uh, and it's right next to the park. <laughs> so uh, that's kind of what we're, we're here trying to, you know, kind of to sort through. Um, like Charlie was saying, the, the trees are all lining the, the elementary school side. That's, those are all going to stay, you know. I mean, there, there might be a few in there, but uh, uh, the rest is all kind of open field, if you were to take a look at that. But um, uh, with that said, we're just looking at changing the PUD from, you know, um, from a uh, little more density. Uh, and the, the original one, you know, I think in 17, 14, it, it turned out to be like uh, just for apartment building and no town homes, no single family homes. So we thought we'd soften that entrance with single family and maybe a town home uh, look uh, before it went into this, you know, the, the apartment building uh, that would be facing the park. So. All right, thank you. Uh, questions for our applicant? Let, um, let me start. Um, sure. Staff brought up a lot of good points in, the, in their report. Um, and there's a bunch of things in there I'm kind of like going, have you guys, don't take this the wrong way, but have you guys thought about this? Um, I mean, things like the stormwater management erosion, the wetland issue, updating the sewers, bringing the apartment up to, to date um, with the fire uh, um, control, the tree issues or whatever. Is that all baked into your plan already? Um, I just, I, what, reading the, the set of recommendations in the staff report, I kind of felt like there was a lot of suggestions uh, being made to you that, at least to me, it was like, okay, that wasn't in the plan, either because it's too early for it or because maybe you didn't think that was going to be necessary. So it's just, I'd love to get your opinion on some yeah. of the things that they they brought up to this point and, and how you plan to deal with those. Sure. Yeah, yeah, we've had a lot of great suggestions um, from your staff, so I appreciate that. Um, and again, this is just a concept plan. Um, but to bring up green building practices, I think that's something really important to us. And it's not really outlined here, but that's something that we're looking into um, as underground cisterns and things like that, where instead of just sending this straight to stormwater, we're able to actually reserve a lot of that on site and then reuse that for irrigation so we're not actually using city water. So areas like that, um, we're looking at semi-permeable um, surfaces so we have less runoff, um, looking at you know where green roofs are a possibility and a lot of other aspects like that. Again, we're still in the concept phase, but um, we're trying to bring in modern technology like that that's green, that's gonna be able to help the city and the site mitigate those kind of those water issues. And again, we're still in pre preliminary aspects of that, but, um, and we're going to be meeting with uh, Lake, actually, what is it? Uh, the district, uh, Purgatory. Oh, uh, Purgatory Creek, Riley Shed District. We've been uh, having conversations with them, and uh, we've got uh, Schmidt uh, Engineer, Land Develop uh, Engineering involved. So uh, we're just toying with that, and we're talking about it, and uh, uh, he says the, um, the stormwater um, holding tanks, kind of like what's under uh, Chick-fil-A, I think is similar uh, to what we're kind of doing uh, with maybe, with the caveat of uh, using that uh, for irrigation. As far as other ones, as far as the, uh, the, uh, the traffic control and whatnot, uh, we were, took counsel um, about uh, you can't bring uh, road, you know, for instance, uh, the Saratoga, I think, uh, or is that Santa Vera? Yeah, it's Santa Vera over there. Uh, Coming, you can't bring a, a a a road onto that because the the other cross rocks are you know too close, and uh, so but a driveway can come off of it. So if it's a one way road, we're we're thinking about a one way coming off of Laredo. We go into that part and exit out, out only. Um, so, um, so there won't, because of the, the, 
the traffic with the school as it lets out or as they come. We just don't want extra people going that direction rather than we rather go, go out to, uh, out to uh, Powers, I guess, or Kerber. Exit out that way. I don't know if that answered your question more or less, just a little bit. What would your design look like if it had to stay within the eight to 16 units per acre? Eight what, to 16. What would the what? What would your, did I have the numbers wrong? The high density unit, is it, is it within the current guidelines? It's I believe that's it. what it was. It's, yeah, it's currently zoned for another apartment building, if I'm not mm. mistaken. We're talking two different things because on the, the PUD, it would permit 30 additional apartment units. Under the land use guides, you can get up to 16 units per acre. So I think the 30 fits in as under 12. Oh, okay. Thank you. So again, I think a part of this, and this is more or less kind of answer your question, maybe more a little bit, is we're actually asking for mixed use. Again, we're not, it's currently zoned for this current apartment building. We're looking at spending an extra amount you know, for underground parking so that this blends more with the neighborhood. It doesn't just look like this massive um, apartment building that takes up this whole whole space. Um, I'm just kind of looking at the visual from Laredo. I have a question. Uh, your concept plan talks about upgrading the existing apartment building, yeah. especially if you were to uh, add a third story. Uh, my question is, are you also planning to upgrade the public spaces, the mechanicals, uh, in the garages as well as the interior of the units? Yeah. Well, we've already it? gone about um, updating the interior of these units, so that's something that's already happening. One, um, you know, everything obviously would be up to code if, you know, that's technically a new build in that regard, so we would follow all protocols uh, along that way. Um, and I won't be, you know, I'll be the first to say, I mean, I, I live in these apartment buildings, and I'll, I'll be willing to admit that it needs updating, and there's no shame in that. Um, and it'll blend more with this neighborhood. Again, we're looking for more of a timeless look that's not gonna be super trendy. Um, you know, this is, again, this is our neighborhood as well. We want it to make it look like something that really fits, fits the area really well. Um, but yeah, then adding that third story, you know, redoing some of the siding um, so that this is gonna match um, kind of the whole area on the, on the development. Mm -hmm. And, and on a note, uh, sorry, um, on a note, this probably will be our, um, you know, probably the last thing, uh, because one, it's fully, fully rented, and two, it would, uh, if anything, we would move all the renters over to the new, while we updated this, this. Um, it would be the last thing on. I think yeah. currently on the concept plan, it has it being the third thing that we would do, but it would actually. Um, you know, removing a roof, you would need to relocate those people. So we would have that apartment building available for those people in the interim while we renovate that second. And floor. it could very well <clears throat> not happen. That might be the. And if you did move them, would they move back then once the upgrades were made to the existing apartment building? Probably. Um, that Depend. or unless they would choose to to live there. I mean, that was yet to to be decided. But um, we just wouldn't want to push people out of their existing units, that would be unfair. So my grandpa proposed that it was, a, it was a good idea to change kind of the build schedule so that we would make sure that we wouldn't outplace anybody during the building process. And if tenants chose to stay during the construction process, do you have any plans to minimize the inconvenience that they would incur during the construction? Well, be, <laughs> being that there's uh, plumbing, electrical, uh, major stuff, we'd be shutting it down pretty much. But the building itself. If we were to put a second story, it would just be hazardous to live there, period. I but, see. Yeah. So the tenants would be would be forced to move. No, just, just into to a this brand new apartment building. Apartment building. <laughs> They'd still be forced to move. Well, we help them out. But could they afford that? What's, your, what's your new price point versus the current rent price? And It what? would be the same. We would just charge it, them. They're our family. Yeah. They've been there. Those people have been there for 25 years. Most of those renters have not left because it's the cheapest rent in Carver County. So if we would 
move them to a different place. No, we would not raise. So you'd be offering them rent controlled units? Yeah. Essentially it's giving a, it's, them places to stand from, yeah. We would do that. We wouldn't, it would not be a force. It would be, and we would give them options. You mentioned a, a few dates. Your, your, I think your grandfather had tried this before. Yeah. Um, had, he ever, had he ever come this far in front of the city, or is just kind of an idea that didn't quite make it this far? Well, or did he actually come and? It just wasn't uh, lucrative because of the PUD, the amount uh, of units in the apartment. We were, it was just an apartment only. Hmm. Uh, it just wasn't uh, for the cost of the unit with the least amount. Of, it just didn't make sense. So, but, uh, so the, and the other the sorry. other years prior to that, um, uh, originally, all the ball fields had about ten of these Santa Vera apartments in it. Uh, in the, in seventy eight, uh, we had ten units <laughs> scheduled in there. And uh, by the way, the the sewer is all set for taking all of that. There's a Right where that point is on there, it's a, a stormwater is was designed to take <coughs> all of that water. That uh, was the first thing that was put in there, but we can check that out. <laughs> um, so I, I think, um, what was your question again? So I, I was looking for a little more context on the history because I hadn't seen a, oh. a history of denials or anything like that. So. No, no denials. Yeah. Uh, it was, there was actually, um, there was a recession that hit our warehouse down in uh, end of Kerber uh, was vacated and uh, uh, so we couldn't move forward on that um, financially um, and then this last one was it just wasn't uh, lucrative and it was kind of like this you know we we're testing the waters and just checking out yeah my grandpa mentioned he's been here so many times he said it has been updated since then <laughs> so so some history Got it. Mm -hmm. And so this is now the, 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 the timing is right for you now because of the numbers we're seeing. This is what makes it lucrative. So the, 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 the we've, I don't know, but we've lost all of our screens up here. Oh, okay. Um, oh, I can still see it there. Um, so without the number of occupants listed in this concept, it's, it's not a, it's not a viable project for you. Is that a, Fair statement? Knock yeah. one of these buildings this, this down, is, yeah. the whole thing goes. Yeah. It's gonna be very hard to make it cost effective for us. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we there's there's obviously this is a concept plan. Sure. So we're here to hear what everyone has to say, what you guys have to say, so that we can go and look at, you know, what are some alternatives. Because already this is, you know, version five, you know, we've we've met with some of your staff. Um, mm -hmm. we've looked at different things, we've gone back to it. Um, made rough sketches and kind of start modeling a little bit more to kind of see how this works out. So again, everything is rough, but we do find that this, this current uh, plan is going to be the, the most effective to make this work. Mm -hmm. But we also want to look at you know, making sure this fits with the community and adding some of that mix, mix housing. And who drew this last plan? Are these sketches from you guys? Yeah, yeah so this is my yeah. work, yeah. Great. Thank you. Is it possible to modify the design of the single-family homes to include an attached garage? I mean, it's a possibility. Again, this is a concept plan. So, um, you know, I, in a lot of ways, I really like, I'm envious of Excelsior, where they have kind of this a little bit more like um, residential Minneapolis kind of vibe. Um, I know that doesn't exist right in Chanhassen, um, but that looking at doing that helped us make these lots, yes, a little bit more narrow. Um, but still creating space for people to kind of enjoy their, that space behind it as well as, again, trying to keep that tree cover. If you're able to move that building so that maybe they're not identical plots as far as where it is, so it's not cookie cutter, you're able to move, you have a little bit more flexibility to maintain that tree cover towards the back, if that kind of makes sense. So, but it's, it's not out of the question. It's just that's kind of a design that we had that we felt... And fit this better just because it kind of flares out towards that back side there we have gotten uh, comments from possible people that would want to buy these can you attach those garages <laughs> especially in the winter time they're not prevalent in chanas and perhaps for a reason i lived in a house 
with a 125 foot long driveway and a detached garage in Minneapolis many yeah. years ago. Yeah, yeah. I would never, ever <laughs> go back, <laughs> ever. Yeah. So seeing a plan of a brand new house with a 100 foot plus driveway and a detached garage, it's like, I'm um, going back 40 years. And, and you know, with that said, you know, I, I, I think so also. I mean, so you turn the garage, you drive through. What we're trying not to do is, is create this, you know, big garage and a front door. You know, it's like, you know, it's, it's everywhere. And, uh, um, uh, and it's more of a neighborhood feel. It feels like, you know, some of the concept drawings that we... I don't know if you've seen those, but uh, uh, of those, it, it looks kind of, you know, bringing in kind of a farmhouse kind of a feel here in, in Chanhassen. Um, the colors are, you know, we haven't really gotten into the colors, and but we, we want to make it look like a really sharp looking neighborhood. And, uh, you know, when we don't want to overwhelm it and, uh, you know, if we find that the townhomes are crowding the, the the old apartment building, then you know we'll probably thin that down. But, uh, yeah. It's really, not only a question, is it? What I say? This is a concept plan. Right. Trying to test the waters, and that's why we're here today. And mm -hmm. you know, moving a garage closer and attaching it, it's not not a big deal. So, if I'm understanding, Bob, uh, the is we're really really looking at just changing the PUD from you know. Um, or taking the verbiage off of uh, no single family or townhomes on that? Generally, yes, that would be the change into up to total units that could be developed on the site. Because yeah. right now it's limited to the 30 additional. So. Other questions? Other questions for our applicant? Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, at this point, I will open the public portion of this hearing. And as I said before, uh, if you'd like to speak on this issue, please approach the podium, state your name and address for the record. Um, and we invite your comments. Good evening. Thank you for hearing me. Um, my name is Stefan Shelkevich. My name is spelled right there. Very long <laughs> Polish last name. Uh, I live at 511 Del Rio. So four houses uh, across the street from this. Um, I think change is inevitable. I think the applicant has the right to do with their property um, and try to do what they want with it. My concern that I'd like, you know, we read earlier some of the concerns people called in and whatnot. And I wanted to come here today, um, being four houses down, I foresee traffic really being an issue. Um, especially as, you know, how many units are proposed forgot exactly the number, but I think it's feasible to say potentially an additional 30 cars, right? In the units, maybe, plus 60 cars, maybe, two per, per, per unit. Um, if you take Del Rio and you go to Santa Fe and you, and you come down, uh, it's an easy way to get to 101, rather than taking Laredo and having to go through two stoplights to get that way. Um, 30 years old, getting married in two months, hoping to have kids, Little nervous about having the kids play in the road, especially when Del Rio does not have a sidewalk. Um, so those are my concerns I'd like to state for whatever record is kept here. Um, so yeah, that's it. Thanks for hearing me. Thank you. Great, thank you. Hi. Hi, good evening. Hi. Welcome. I'm Jeannie Wislowski and I live at 517 Laredo Lane. So right now I'm in the cul-de-sac so my backyard overlooks the existing apartments and uh, I guess I'm not so concerned about the trees but that the fact that now when I'm looking out my window it's a little bit blocked but if they put on the third story of the apartments <laughs> it'll be like hi I'm looking all over there um, and I guess it, it just seems like a lot to me I could you know some yes but it's a little concerning when I looked at how many they were, how much they were proposing to put in there. So just from a, I guess, a, my point of view, <laughs> my little selfish point of view, is it would yeah definitely be some changes and more traffic and. But if it's uh, you know what everybody feels like would be the best, 
I can live with it. Of course, I'd be concerned about how long it would take with the construction noise and uh, things like that. But just wanted to give my point of view. So, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Charles Lipfin. I live on Laredo Drive, right across the street from the elementary school. Do any of you gentlemen live on Laredo Drive or Santa Vera? No. No. Okay. Right now we got sports going on. Santa Vera is down to one lane because the police do not monitor the no parking signs. Right now, as we speak, the whole school parking lot is full all the way in front of the elementary school. Are you planning on doing a traffic survey study? Yes. Yes? yes. When? Hopefully when school is open, not during the summer when there's no traffic. That's a huge concern of mine. I've lived in this town since 1960 in that edition over there, Scholar Second Edition, probably longer than they've been building homes in this town since 1963, he says. They've tried three, four times to build on that property. Now they're going after it again because the Met Council says they can. I don't think that's right, what the Met Council is doing and what they say you have the right to do. This is City Chanhassen. We should do what we want to do. One concern that Bob made, or not concerned, but one thing that he spoke of was false. When they did Laredo Drive project probably 10 years ago, sewer, water, curb, the whole road went all the way from Main Street all the way down to Sunrise Hills. Everybody that lived on Laredo Drive and the cul-de-sacs forked over six grand for that project. And that property there didn't pay one red cent, even though they have a driveway coming out on Laredo Drive because they said their main driveway was on Santa Vera. They never paid a thing for that. The sewer, water, all that. The wetlands that were redone going down to Kerber Pond that we paid for, that they're gonna utilize for their project, was not financed at all by them. Now they're gonna utilize that and that's a concern with you guys, with your wetlands. There are deer living in that woods right now. Maybe we should get the DNR involved with it. See what they have to say about the wildlife in this town and the green space. I cannot do anything on my property because of the ground cover. How much ground cover is gonna be left when they do what they want to do. Look at Chanhassen. It's all ground cover. There's no green space in this town. Nothing left anyways. And that parking lot that's an eyesore that he spoke of, they were reimbursed because the city of Chanhassen and the developer used that piece of property to stage all their equipment when they did that whole road project. So that's the way that is because of what happened with the road project. All the construction stuff and everything was all done right there. And now they got actually two accesses on Laredo Drive. Curb and gutter and driveways going into their properties that they never paid anything for. That was a huge concern with the people that paid for this road project that they got that. So, when they say they can do whatever they want, and obviously this is a town with money, Money Magazine said it's number one, it's all about money. It's not about what the people want. It's about what they want as builders. Hell, they're, they're willing to kick everybody out of their apartment complex right now to put a third story on it. That's all about money. So, when you vote on this, or pass it on to the city council, Think about what they want to do. What is good for this town? 
and the inner circle right here. The fire department is running 24 hours a day now. Seven days a week, they got a full-time staff. I met with the chief last week. He said they have more calls than ever. What is that traffic going to do on Laredo Drive? In Santa Vera, that's the only other road to get from Curver to this side of town without going through a stoplight. Which is a death trap. Exactly. It's a death trap. Especially when it's down to one lane. My daughter's been hit on it. My kids have almost been hit so on it. It's a death trap. Go on Santa Vera some night when there are sports. It's down to one lane. I can't believe that's never been brought up in any of the safety aspects in this town, especially the fire department. Thank you for listening to me. I appreciate it. We'll see you at the city council meetings. <laughs> Thank you. Have a nice Thank night. You. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right. Well spoken. Hi, uh, Dave Buckholtz, my wife, Kaiza. We are at 7541 Chippewa Trail. So essentially we have a corner lot on Santa Vera and Chippewa Trail. It's just out of view on the picture up there. Um, so most of our concerns have kind of already been addressed. Um, I think we'll try to keep it brief, but there's three big ones. Uh, number one, the apartment building, three stories tall, is going to be Eyesore. right into our daughter's window, right into our son's window, about probably 75% plus of our yard. It's like our entire backyard will be visible from the third floor of that building. Um, second thing, um, traffic, like was meant, already mentioned, baseball, Santa Vera is covered in cars, maybe even to some extent right now. Um, yeah, our kids aren't allowed to play in the front yard because we're at that stop sign. So what we have a, people don't abide. Yeah, I, I mean, as someone who lives next to a stop sign, I, maybe it's a little grandiose to make the claim, but I'd bet 60% of people don't stop the stop sign. Um, uh, I don't know, lastly, I think based on the, the drawings and everything, I think there's no way the current ownership could maintain that. I mean, they've dressed it up in the last couple of years, but there's some stuff like, you know, graffiti on the rocks that's been there since day, day one, since we moved here almost 10 years ago. So it's five minutes with pressure washer. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Good job, Dan. Thank you. Sir, if you'd like to come speak, I right. welcome you to come up, but I'd ask you to please remain silent in, in the audience. Thank you. Hello, I'm Christina Ahola. I live at 7496 Saratoga, so just right there. Um, I'm here also representing my parents. We moved here in 1979. They can't be here because they're at the uh, community event at the rec center and they're refereeing soccer. So I'm here representing them. Um, when earlier this spring, my mother and I were walking through the park and we were like, oh, this is just an eyesore. We need some better housing for our community. We need to add people to it. Then we saw the property development and we were very excited to see it. So we fully support that this is getting built and that we're adding population to Chanhassen. There's issues to be addressed parking, street traffic on Santa Vera, as everyone has said, is absolutely terrible. We avoid going that way uh, during sporting events. Uh, the drain water is absolutely an issue. Um, my father is an engineer, so that was his concern. And then also the population, if someone mentioned we're adding 35 homes, that adds two cars each, let's say, that's 60 more cars are people going to be parking on Santa Vera and Laredo? So there is concern there, but generally speaking, we're very excited for that ugly forest to go away and for having more people here in Shanhassen. So that's what I got. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Derek Mallott, 7501 Chippewa Trail, <clears throat> not far from these folks here. And uh, I'm wondering, Am I allowed to ask questions to the, the developers at all, or does it have to be directed to the council? Yeah, it is, it is your public comment. It's not really a Q&A session. Um, okay. If you ask a question and the developer happens to answer it, Are they I won't stop the them. Audience, but if it or, becomes like, a... What's if, the protocol yeah. here? I mean, I have questions. Yes. I want to provide some feedback, and I think this is the forum to do that. I just want to ask a couple questions. So if this isn't the forum... Where might it, I be able to do that? I, I would say this is a forum for you to give your feedback. 
Um, the forum for questions, there, there will be hearings for this when it becomes a, an actual PUD request. Am I correct about that? Um, and so this is, this is for you to give that feedback. So if there is advice, recommendations, feedback, things you think are true and you want to debunk, this well, will be I a great place. I certainly don't place. have any advice, and this is my first foray into municipal government apart from parks and recreation, so we'll, we'll go with that uh, statement for the record. Um, also let the record state that this man makes a very delicious cup of coffee. I've had it uh, firsthand <laughs> from the farmer's market. Um, what I'll also say is some of my concerns. So I'm going to have to plead some ignorance here. I don't know if, if this, any element of this is going to be like low income housing or anything like that or if there's going to be any resale of certain property and some of it's being rental property. So some of those concerns I might have are dependent upon the answers to those questions. But ultimately I did the math, I think, if I did it correctly, which high likelihood I might not have, about 73 roughly uh, units, um, if you include the existing 18, in an area that looks like it's fit for maybe four houses. And so I'm not gonna say anything that probably hasn't been said, but when you factor in 73 units, maybe one to three people per unit, you one car here, two cars there, um, I think we're getting into uh, high density, right? Like really high density. and. My concern is with the, the, the traffic and the number of bodies and um, if there's any element of uh, who's coming in to rent those places, if it is low income, are we dealing with any sort of um, enhanced chance of crime or any of those things. Like my concerns are just about having this much uh, density in such a small location is of concern, but it would be really nice to have that area cleaned up. So um, for the record, having that updated, cleaned up, nice would be great. I too share a bit of skepticism uh, about the, the current level of upkeeping as uh, last fall we were there um, walking daily when it was nice out and there was a stroller on the front lawn for free for over a week. Nothing happened and Halloween happened and it ended up on our road and we had to actually take it back to our garbage can and get rid of it and so if you're going to invest all this time and money in making something beautiful I would hope that it would be upkept in such a way as to prevent any spillover of garbage into the, the neighboring areas. So. Um, I'm concerned, uh, but, and I'd like to know more, and I'd like to hear more about it, uh, and I'd like you all to act as though you will live right next door to this thing. And some of you might, I don't know, uh, but I do, and we're concerned. Thank you. Great. Thank you. A lot of pressure. <clears throat> Hello, uh, Thomas Wilmer, 517 Del Rio Drive. I literally live right across the street from the gravel driveway. <clears throat> of the, the, the location. A little nervous here and sitting around, pressure. Uh, first question is, has the app applicant submitted for any variances for the project? I basically have eight generally listed on what they're probably going to have to deal with right now is the height. I have three levels with underground parking, 40 vertical feet, literally, at this point. Is that going to be applied for in a variance? I don't believe that that exists in Chanhassen for that location. Distances to streets from the buildings, it's just a concept drawing. There's no measurements, there's no dimensions, there's no scale. <clears throat> the way I look at it, it's gonna be pavement and, um, uh, and roofs in that sense. And then with the distance to the streets on, uh, within the complex and around the existing streets, very, very close. Building separation, fire risk, jumping, especially with the, the single family homes. And then we have the, uh, <clears throat> the townhomes, apparently six in the proximity to the existing apartment complex. I mean, you would just almost reach out and touch them. Uh, hardscape percentage. We're gonna probably come down from, well, right now it's gravel, 60, 70% um, uh, just softscape. We're gonna probably be at 60 to 70% easily of hardscape. Where the water is going to go is going to be at the gravel driveway, which the gentleman mentioned earlier that they didn't know about the sewer system and the payment and the uh, assessment. Large amount of water flows into that one primary drain on the east side of the property. I've been there for, well, lived there for 12 odd years and seen that. And do we have a setback issue with the, the school, the path, and the parkway? <clears throat> the back of the apartment complex is literally going to be hit with uh, fall balls from the field. It is just, I mean, we're talking 20 feet, 15 feet maybe behind the pathway. 
uh, emergency vehicle access. The through road, is that just a one-way road or is that wide enough for two emergency vehicles to pass through? Based on the drawings, you couldn't put a fire truck through there and maybe, and well, a cop car, but not an ambulance. And sewer, where's all this water gonna go in that sense, because all the hardscape, there's basically three drains that feed the area and basically one of them is probably gonna hold 70% of the drainage. And that's the east side drain by the uh, gravel driveway. And are we gonna see an architectural or scaled drawing actual dimensions of this before we basically go to the next step? Uh, send the new apartment building, what is the proposed height? I don't know. So as I said, it's gonna be 40 feet is the underground garage going to be completely dug in? Really heavy equipment, 10, 12 feet below ground grade, and then just three levels above, or is it gonna be under unit parking? So now we're at our 40 odd plus feet of height. Uh, general deal on vehicles, 30 units, one car per, pretty rare, 30 vehicles, 20 parking outside, we're gonna have Generally, uh, dual car families, cohabitation. We're already at 60 cars, 10 above the capacity of the proposed parking. And now uh, we have um, uh, street parking. Is that gonna be a change in amendment or ordinance within the city for it? And then snow removal. Where is it all gonna go? Um, <clears throat> with all the, the homes, townhomes, and the drive-through, where is the snow gonna go? I mean, there literally would have to be a mountain on the would be the north e yeah northeast corner it just they're just physically they're gonna run out of places to put the snow and our townhouses are they gonna have parking garages or just driveway not clarified once again snow removal becomes an issue they're just gonna push it across the street into the into the homes or they're gonna push it into the apartment complex or they're gonna push it on laredo drive and once again, our, you know, spacing, fire risk issue, so close. And are they going to be at the same setback that my home is, 35 odd feet from Laredo Drive, along with my neighbor, Carol and um, <clears throat> Rachel Nathaniel? Will they have to meet that same <clears throat> distance right along Laredo, the one home and then the, the new town home? Annual apartment complex. We have parking there. We're, Barely sufficient now, it's all right, near capacity. We put another level on, another eight to 16 automobiles, where are they gonna go? Are they gonna double deck the existing parking garage or it'll have to be plowed and just literally be a, a parking lot to add for that capacity? And uh, the homes are set back in spacing. Hopefully there's, um, that will be within uh, our, our current ordinance. And the tree removal, Yes, it'd be nice, most likely 90% cut down to get, the, to get the homes in there, the driveways in there. You know, cottonwoods this big around, the root systems are gargantuan. Maybe keep one or two, but I believe probably 90% removal, if not more, similar to what happened to the, the Prince property, you know, mowed and then every square inch. <clears throat> and then the roadway. Is the roadway through it? Is it going to be a one way? or is it basically just an actual roadway that meets state, city um, ordinance rules for two vehicles to pass, especially emergency vehicles. And I'm sitting here looking at the timeline, end of 2023, rather aggressive, um, trying to assume if there's any ordinance or variance application approval issues. I don't see that to be plausible uh, in that sense. And, I don't mind them making an upgrade. The apartment complex is just basically shooting the moon. I would prefer if they were gonna do something, you know, a couple of nice townhomes, double bungalows, some, uh, some single family homes at 150 to $200,000 for a quarter acre lot. I could look at them right at the edge of town in Eden Prairie, a little posted stamp McMansion on a $200,000 lot. There's profitability there in just simply selling parcels of property and then building a home. They could be outside of that responsibility and yet gain, gain the profit uh, in that sense. 
So I believe uh, that'll be it. Any other questions? I don't know. But are we going to be having an additional meeting shortly on this? I don't know of the whole procedure, but this is the first step. The next step will be variances or any ordinance or any issues, or we're looking at a real piece of paper with real dimensions so we can actually define what we have, what we're looking at. And to detach homes, that's rough. It's a cold walk. But uh, I don't know when that's going to take place or that just will be listed in time on the, on the, the website of the council. Mr. Chair, we'll still go back on that. I, I think we need to go back and reframe what this process is about and what the next steps are. So we'll, after the public hearing, we'll do that. Meaning she'll have answers for you as soon as the public hearing portion is closed. Right. Just wonder what the next step is going. All right, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Hello. I'm excited to be up here. Um, my name is Keely Unruh. I also live at 7501 Chippewa Trail. I'm new to the neighborhood, new to Chanhassen. I love Chanhassen. Um, I was very specific about the neighborhood that I moved into. I have a five-year-old son. He's about to start kindergarten at the elementary school um, just down the road. And um, I know Charlie. He's made a wonderful cup of coffee for me. I went back to see him last weekend. And um, so I think he's wonderful. Um, the biggest thing that I want to say is Chanhassen seems like a walkable community. It seems like a safe community. You can go outside, you can, you can take your kid out, you feel good going out into it. My only comment is that um, this doesn't feel very safe. And so I ask if you guys could maybe reevaluate and um, come back to the drawing board. I would like that. So that's all I really have to say. I, I'm excited to see what you come up with, because I think you can do great things. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hello. My name is Gordy Nagel. I live at 514 Del Rio Drive, which is literally two houses away from this proposed development. And I would like to compliment Doug Hansen. He built my house. <laughs> Back in 2017, did a marvelous job. I had a friend over the other day who actually commented. He says, you know, you actually real, you realize you actually live in a Norman Rockwell neighborhood, <laughs> which I took as a compliment. And when I saw the plans for the new development, my heart went out. It doesn't fit. It doesn't fit the neighborhood. It's too compact. I understand that he's trying to recoup some of the value of the land he's got, but I vehemently oppose this plan. It doesn't fit with the neighborhood. I would suggest they go back and sharpen their pencils. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Have we missed anyone? Anyone else for the public portion? No? All right. Seeing none, I will close the public portion of this and what do we do next? Why don't we clarify the process sure. at this point? Thank you. Um, th for those in the audience, I'm Kate Amundsen. I'm the Community Development Director. Um, so I've been here over 30 years. I've walked that neighborhood on my lunch hour quite a bit. So um, just want to clarify kind of the PUD process and how it works. We've done a number of PUDs. The Prince property was brought up. We, we Through the PUD, we made smaller lots, but we acquired a donation of 50 acres. Uh, the biggest one we've got is, um, well, there's two big ones. One is Villages on the Pond, um, which is where St. Hubert's Church is, um, and those are over there. So um, they have a shared, we've got high-density residential over there uh, with Prez Homes, and um, we also have commercial office space over there. The other large one we have, which you'll be seeing amendment to with the PUD, a mixed PUD, is Avienda. So that one, we also have small lot homes. We also have apartment buildings. We also have senior high rise. It's a very mixed use development. So all of these projects started off with a concept. So the purpose here is to hear the concerns and everybody's taking notes and this, all this will be verbatim brought up to the city council. The public hearing's been held here so your comments will be advanced. So the purpose of the PUD is for them to get their ideas out there there's no exact drawings. There currently is, and I would encourage everybody, if you go to the city's website, you can download the staff report, 
which is the presentation that was made tonight. In that presentation, we addressed all the things that need to be done. A traffic study that was told that needed to be done. Uh, accommodate additional stormwater runoff. All those things are part of this plan. So in order for this plan to be advanced, it has to meet all those criteria. And it may not. We don't know. They have to go through that. But the goal of this is to say, if you want to go forward, you have to address these things. Do you still have the opportunity when it comes back, if it comes back, to say whether or not um, it, it meets your intent? But again, the goal of this is for the concept is to people in good faith, both parties, give a recommendation of where you see this going. It's a recommendation. It has, it's not legal binding, but is the intent to be, um, in, to be fair to both parties. So the developers bring you what they believe to get disclosure with the public, and the Planning Commission and the City Council also give their fair comments. So they decide whether or not how and it's going to be reshaped. So are there final drawings with all the setbacks? No. But if you look at the current PUD, how they have it, there are setbacks and standards in there. The 65% hardcover, all those are already baked into the current PUD. Do they have the ability to amend the PUD when they go back to the process? That's part of this whole discussion, to say whether or not we think it merits making some tweaks to get a better project or a different type of unit mix. So this is their first attempt to air it in the public and see where we go. So I hope... That clarifies some of the process. So it goes to the city council with all the minutes attached to it. We'll make another presentation that there won't be a public hearing there, but we'll represent via the minutes and then the staff report. Um, and again, that staff report is available to the public, so anybody can read all the comments we have. And from there, the developer will make a decision how they want to proceed. Okay. Can I ask, it sounds like there are quite a few current safety concerns with this neighborhood that are boiling over. Is, are there resources that the citizens can currently utilize to address those concerns with the city? Uh, safety regarding traffic? Yeah, the sure. parking and the stop sign. And Sure. I think those are um, things that we can, um, I think it's best if it comes to a residence, but we can certainly report that back to the sheriff's office. Too. Is there somewhere that this, the current citizens can report that, though? Yeah. I'm sorry. I... We do have a traffic safety committee. So that's, would they contact you, Eric, or who would they contact? Uh, they can go directly to the uh, city of Chanhassen's website, or you can do a seat 56 for traffic concerns. Those get routed to the traffic safety committee that meets once a month. Those concerns then are evaluated, addressed, um, and then if action is needed, it's usually spearheaded through the engineer's public works department and or get recommendations from the city council. Thank you. Great, thank you, Kate. So, clarification yes, question real please. quick. So a, a no vote from this commission tonight on this would completely kill the process no. or not? No. no. We what are would it do? Yeah. The city council. So yeah. this would go to city council regardless of our vote. It's just we're recommending other up All you down. recommend, well, you can recommend um, anything within the what comments you've heard. If you want to add to, subtract from the comments already added. Or say, in summation, we would like the council to review what was heard in the public hearing. We have some of the same, whatever you want to say. It's a recommendation. Mm -hmm. The only thing that's going to be binding is when the city council makes a recommendation. Again, that would be a recommendation in good faith, what they expect. That's, a, that's the, uh, the intent here. Other clarifying questions from staff, or for staff, I'm sorry. Kate, uh, just a question to clarify in my mind and probably a few others on the on the committee. Um, you talked to, about the process and, and that was super helpful. There's a really good chance that if this gets through us today and it gets approved by the, the city council, we're probably going to talk about this again in the, in the future as this thing progresses, Absolutely. correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. So it would come back with the PUD. You'd be drafting if they're making changes to that, looking at the product, looking at all the setback, just like you do with a normal application. You would look at all that. But as we've already indicated, we don't want a, seat, a through street. Um, we want a traffic study. So there's a lot of heavy lifting yet before it comes back to you. And then we'll also um, review it internally to make sure it meets all the city standards. And then be more detail on the height, the materials. All those are part of the PUD. As I stated already in there, in the PUD, there are some prescriptive things that they have to follow. So would there be variances? They would 
typically we do those through an amendment to the PUD as you know so that would be, have to be a, a discussion well is it does it merit that you know what is the benefit of doing that so those are all just decisions to be made so I think there was a lot of good comments that were um, garnered here to um, guide you and the City Council other questions for staff before we move into just straight up commissioner comments all right Thoughts? We will most likely go down the line, so you can go first, you can go last, you can go in the middle, whatever you like. I'll go first. Yes, sir. <clears throat> this is a very interesting meeting, and I appreciate everybody's uh, time and your opinions tonight. They're very important to all of us. Uh, I'm new to the commission, but I am not new to pitching ideas. I've been doing it for 50 years. That's my job. And one of the things I learned a long time ago was that you've got one chance to make a first impression. And my sense is, from what I believe, and based on my aesthetic sense and what I've heard tonight, is that the developer is premature in coming to the commission tonight with a concept plan. There are so many issues and concerns about it, both aesthetically and with respect to density and safety. It just is of concern to me that, and they may have done this, I don't know, I'm not making an assumption here, but there wasn't any field testing. There wasn't any getting just comments from the neighbors and other people impacted by this development that could have been incorporated into whatever concept plan they would have presented to us today, realizing that it's still a concept plan, it's very general and very loose. But um, I just have some grave concerns about the, the whole idea of the project being. It just doesn't fit with the neighborhood uh, that I visited uh, this week several times. And I'm just very concerned about um, some of the issues that I have with what I see. Uh, and I'm concerned about going forward. If it's not going to be financially viable for them to make any modifications to reduce density and deal with some of the other issues, uh, it's of concern to me. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you happen to be sitting right next to him, so please. Excellent. My turn. Um, so typically when we get packets from staff, there's a recommendation and there's a few things outlined underneath it of this is what needs to happen next. This says, yeah, it can go forward, but honestly, there are three pages and 34 recommendations of traffic study. They have to go through. So almost everything we've heard tonight needs to be ironed out. And like staff has said, we're going to see this again. So I look at, there are so many constraints on this, and it's so tight around exactly what happens, that if we said yes, that's a very tight box they have to work in. And most of the concerns you see, for example, the first one I had was, it must address the comprehensive plan inconsistency. It has to prepare tree preservation, has to recommend use of a private street, a traffic impact study must be performed by a licensed engineer, and so on. Almost all the concerns that are here are written into this, so it has to happen before it moves forward. So this group will again see it, and then, like you said, we'll have variances, we'll have issues that will go through. Um, my biggest one is the three floor apartment building and line of sight for, I don't know if it'll impact cars, I don't think it will, but for the people who are around it. That's the one that, that's the one that sticks with me. And even with all these, I, I don't know if there's a Venn diagram that they'll meet up that will find a happy spot for both the developer and what they're trying to do. Thank you. It's up to you. I'll leave it up to you. All right. Thank you. Um, to me, there's a, this is a pretty simple um, discussion. Um, I mean, if, if you look at it, the comprehensive plan allows for a density of 61 units right now. They have basically told us this thing doesn't work financially unless you have 70 or more. Right. That, that's, that's why we're having this discussion today is to move that number from 61 to 70 to, to proceed. 
I can understand why they don't have all the details worked out. Why would you have all the details worked out if you don't know that you can get the number one thing you need, which is the increased density, to make this go financially? So the rest of this whole process and all the great work the staff has done, I think that will all get fleshed out at, at some point in time when there's um, more detailed design, if we get to that point. Um, to me, it's, it's really, um, do we think having changing the density to, to allow for the 15% variance that they're asking for, from, and that's the, going from the 61 to the 70, is, is a good thing. Um, you know, in order to, do, to get that, the Met Council's come up, um, you have to have, you have to deem this as a, affordable housing, right? Which when you think about it, is a little bit of a dichotomy because you're trying to, to maximize the amount of revenue that you can get off of this project to help pay for all those huge infrastructure costs that you have up front. Whether that's the stormwater, the wetlands, the sewers, bringing the apartments up to date, there's a big investment in this, in the, in this project. Um, I think somebody had mentioned, hey, let's, let's put some houses on it. Well, you can sell those lots for a ton of money, but that's not a recurring stream of revenue for the, for the, uh, um, the developers. So I, I, I think that's probably a key part of this because you've got all of that, that infrastructure that you, you need to pay for. Um, so to me, it's really the question of, do we think um, approving this so that the density can go to seven, 70 and have, a, have further discussions about some of the details related to the plan um, is warranted? So that's my, my comments. Commissioner Noyes. I will now shift gears. And anyone over here who would like to speak? I'll go. Um, I agree with what Ed and Eric said. I think, um, generally speaking, I kind of heard, you know, the area could use a facelift um, as part of this. Um, there's there's going to be so many layers of rules and regulations that have to happen. Um, and what's being presented is very conceptual. So, so that's not what's going to end up likely what's going to end up being built because they got to they got to fit all they gotta check all the city boxes um, through the approval process. So, I I agree with um, increasing the density if that's what needs to happen to to make this work financially. Okay, so it seems, I don't know, it seems pretty clear that a lot of folks think the property should be re redeveloped. I think I tend to agree, given what it looks like, and I also tend to agree that the, the owners of the property should be able to, uh, you know, redevelop the property because it's theirs um, within the confines of what's acceptable to the community, to the city. Um, ideally, what happens there should also fit the neighborhood. Folks have bought houses there, have lived there, with an understanding of how it's zoned and, and, what, the, and what the community vibe is, right? And if we suddenly dramatically change that, I think that's potentially a disservice to the people who live there. Um, is it a dramatic change, though? It's already zoned high density. You gave some good numbers. That kind of cleared it up a little bit for me, too, in terms of the percentage kind of that we that we move the needle from what's already approved it being zoned as a high density I have that right right this is zoned as high density already it is a bit strange to me that this tiny little corner is zoned high density given like where it sits between park school and single family neighborhood then again it is um, it is zoned that way so they have you know permissibility to already do so much of this project I don't know. Is it the right project? Is this the right concept? Not sure. But I think process is is there so that we can all, what I've heard today is this is to take the next step forward so we can all understand what is the right way to redevelop this property that sort of keeps everybody as whole as possible. Um, my conversation's good and I think fact finding is good. It sounds like we only move forward with fact finding if we take the next step. We should probably do it. That's all I have. I, my gut reaction when I first joined the commission is not liking high density. And I have learned over the last year that in the world that we live in, 
that is the new rule of the game in development. It is small lots. It is maximizing your dollar. And I think having a developer that lives in the neighborhood and actually cares about the community is important. And I think that if they're not able to viable, make this work, they'll sell the land and a developer who does not live here will come and do the exact same thing. And they may not listen to the neighborhood's concerns the way that this developer is willing to. So working with a local developer is important to me. I don't think that the single family homes in there necessarily make sense um, the way that they've been doing it with Avienda with the detached townhomes, the same thing in Excelsior with the row houses. Um, if you look at the 2040 comprehensive plan and what the city wants for downtown and making it walkable and being able to bring in additional residents, I think that something like this makes sense. It's what it's zoned for. It is what is going to happen eventually. So I think finding a way to make it work now with a developer who is local is important. And I think we should take the next step to try and make that work. Right. May I ask the, the commissioners who want to move forward with the plan, does that presume that you agree to increase the density from the 60 or however many units it is to what they're asking for? My for, for me, it does, it does not necessitate that I agree with that move, no. Um, my yes vote for recommend is to learn more about what this would actually materialize as and if there's other compromises that we can make. Seems to me that the process going forward, the city is in the driver's seat. Um, there's, like somebody else said, there's a lot of constraints and there's a tight box to fit in here. So I would vote yes to move forward with fact finding and learning more about this and how we can make it work. Um, I would answer no to your question. I wouldn't necessarily presume that I agree to increase the. But the net, net is. is if the developer can't make it work with the existing density, then it's, there's no deal. I mean, it, it can't be done. So the only way it's gonna move forward from what the developer has said is if we increase the density units, which is going to severely impact and change the character of the existing neighborhood. Is that an, a reasonable well, assumption? Well, I think you're missing the part where there's three or four pages of conditions they have to meet. In it, well, right. I so understand we don't what, know that until they actually provide all that information. So I think kind of going to the next level, then you'll you'll learn more. I mean, it might be another concept coming back. You know, it might be dropping off the uh, upgrade to the existing apartment building. You know, that's a number. Of, you know, we're talking you know, ten units. Um, so there's different ways to make that work. So what what they've heard from the neighbors and what we've the staff has given them is a pretty tall order and so it's going to shape how that can work based on tree preservation and access to the site there has to be a fire turnaround internally all those things we said it has to be a private street all those things are to drive the shape and form what they're here today is just to ask are you willing to let us continue on this path if you're, we're not going to then we need to change course it's a recommendation obviously the city council will weigh in on that too and I understand that and I appreciate that but I'm forgive me for being dense but I'm trying to get my head around the fact if they can't make the numbers work with the existing density requirements, all the rest of it is for naught. I mean, they can come back with all sorts of changes and agreements to the sanitary sewers and the this and the that, but if they can't make the numbers work, that's the bottom line, right? And they're not gonna go forward unless we agree and the city council agrees to increase the density. Am I, what am I missing? Well, if they evaluate the project and say we have to meet the density, 16 units an acre, so we lose nine units out of it, is there a configuration for this development that would work? Rather than, again, not expanding the existing apartment building, but go with more townhouse or more small cottage homes have a higher value than an apartment unit, and so does that make the numbers work for them? So based on all the direction that we're giving them, then they can evaluate it on a more uh, firm basis, if you will, and say, this is what it would cost, this is what return we would need. Thank you. So um, fantastic content tonight. Thank you to everyone that showed up. 
We usually sit in these chambers alone and run through items, and it is great to have you here. Um, and for my fellow uh, commission members, many of whom are new, I am so happy that you have experienced one of these now. Hmm. So um, I'll tell you some of the things that stood out for me. Um, someone, a gentleman in the audience, asked that we pretend that we live across the street from this planned development. That is, I believe, our job as commissioners. I also believe it is our job to pretend that we are the applicant, um, to be able to see both sides of the issue. And, and there's, I'd say, two things that stand out for me, one on each side tonight. The, the first one is, if I saw that picture, and I know it's a concept, and I know it's preliminary, but if I saw that picture, it would scare the hell out of me. It, even just the use of the shadows make it look like that apartment building is humongous. Whether it is or not, we don't know yet because we haven't done that due diligence. And that's not part of this decisioning. But from a concept standpoint, I can see why neighbors are a little bit terrified as to that picture. Um, and so I have to challenge myself as a commissioner to not make decisions off of that picture because that picture is not real. That picture is a concept. However, First impressions, right? And, and tonight has been a first impression. And if I put myself in the shoes of the developers, if I put myself in the shoes of the investors here, a recommendation by this body going forward and a positive recommendation by the city council saying, yep, we're good with this direction, means go ahead and start pouring some money into it and then bring it back up to us again, and we'll see if we approve everything in that list of 24 things we were going to make you do. That's the part that's a little tough for me. So I, I, when I put myself in the, in the developer's shoes right now, I say, am I better off telling them this is a bad plan, and someone in here said it, go back to the drawing board? before you spend all of this money to do all of these engineering studies and all of these water studies and, and potentially come up with a new concept plan that you can rally the neighborhood around, that you can have this same audience in here all speaking on your behalf versus what are you doing to my neighborhood? So I know the, the generic or the, the general gist of what we are here to do tonight is it, it really actually if correct me if I'm it really only boils down to this thing is slated for apartments and we're saying it'll be okay with also some townhouses and also some single single family homes and then there's a whole bunch of rules that have to be in order that would be an easy thing to do but I don't know that it's the right thing to do because I, I don't think I, I think where I'm landing is I don't want to send these folks the message to go ahead and start writing checks against this concept. And the word direction that is in the very proposed motion recommends city council approve the direction, I think is where I'm, I'm having a bit of a struggle. And I, um, if I have my druthers, uh, I'm very much leaning towards the side of not having city council approve the direction hoping that feedback from the neighborhood is taken for a new potential concept plan that will be so much more smooth sailing for the investors, but also be a little more confident in writing all those checks that are, that are living in between tonight and the actual PUD that would come before this planning commission however many months from now. Just my opinion. Um, other comments from commissioners? I personally took the direction as the direction is a mixed single, or not a mixed single family, but a mixed high density use. And mm -hmm. what that means based on the feedback here today could completely change. But for them to be able to go figure out how to change that and take this feedback to move to the next step to be able to do those studies, I think is a crucial part of it. Yeah, I agree. I, I agree with what you're saying. I, I just want to emphasize what you're saying, too. I mean, there's some risk to the private party involved here, right? I mean, there's risk if you 
really shoot for everything that gives you perfect profitability, I mean, you could end up failing down the road and not even getting this approved, and you've wasted all that time and effort. So, But I, I don't think we can even start having... I look at this as phase one of the negotiation, and we can't have phase two if we just all say no tonight. So I would say, you know, keep that risk in mind, obviously, but you guys are professionals, so you know that already. You don't need me to say that. So to me, listening to everybody's comments, and I, I very much appreciate the insight. It's very helpful. The question is, to the developer, would the developer be more motivated to make the proposed adjustments and changes if we denied the request tonight or if we approved the request tonight? And that's a rhetorical question. I don't have the answer. Is there any history that the city can share with the commission on other developments that have occurred in the past where something similar has occurred? Or to be perfectly honest, I can't remember the, you know, that we've done. But we have had a lot of iterations of PUDs. Avienda, uh, Villages on the Pond have all come back. Uh, over time, they've reshaped. Um, so, yeah. So in those examples, Kate, have the, has the commission and the council approved the concept plans and the developer makes required and requested changes and modifications and slowly but surely over time it gets reshaped and yes. reformed? Yes, I would think that's probably more, more true. Hmm. So if I may, Chair, I mean, the, we're either going to, they're going to sit and wait for the city council, you know, and if, if you're going to say come back completely and then that would, that, that's a possibility, so it sits and then they come back and wait a month or two and then work it back through the same concept again. That could happen, so. Well, by my calculations, um, there's certainly a mixed bag on this commission right now. So um, for educational purposes, um, there is a proposed motion that recommends approval of this. One of you could make that motion. We could vote on that. Okay. You may alter the proposed motion and recommend that we do not approve the direction and issues, and we could vote on that. Or you could come out of the blue and make up your own motion if you like. <laughs> and you're also welcome to provide more comments and try to convince each other and myself of otherwise. I'll make a motion. There it is. The Chanhassen, ugh, the Chanhassen Planning Commission recommends City Council approve the direction and issues for the concept approval of PUD number 2022-09, Hanson Homes 2022 Development Project, as outlined in the staff report. We have a valid motion. Do we have a second? My second. We have a second. We'll do a roll call vote. Uh, just straight down the line here. Aye. 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 Nay. Nay. Aye. Nay. Uh, four to three, it is approved and recommended to City Council to approve the direction and issues. Thank you all. You're welcome to stay as we note the minutes of our last meeting and listen to updates about City Council. Uh, on that note, would anyone care to note the minutes from May 17th? So noted. <laughs> well done. <laughs> well done. And City Council action updates. Sure. Um, thank you. Um, so at their meeting on Monday, uh, June 13th, the City Council approved all the code amendments that you addressed, you know, mm -hmm. specifically n nuisances. Good job, um, that's Mackenzie. Thing. Yep. And then they approved the final plat for the Earhart Farms and then removed that from the Rural Service District, which is a, a reduction in taxes. And then also they approved a vacation um, of a drainage utility easement, which allowed the Pat Cunningham project to go forward. Um, so with that, um, we do not have a meeting on the 5th of July. Historically, we haven't because we tend to have not usually a quorum. I think people are so. 
<laughs> so, um, yeah, so we do have a meeting on uh, July 19th, and we do have um, two subdivisions on for that meeting, um, a one-lot subdivision and then a four-lot subdivision. So I know I've got two people that will be missing, so if anybody else will be missing on the 19th, if they could give us a heads up, that'd be great. That's all I had. Wonderful. Um, really, really good job tonight, you guys. It's always fun when there's a, a crowd and great to have input from the public. So I appreciate everything you guys did. So um, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Mm -mm. <clears throat> so close. Motion to adjourn? Just say motion to adjourn. There it is. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We are adjourned.